indeed He is. What a blessing to join our voices together and sing. He is worthy. And that's why we're here today. If He were not, there would be nothing to sing about. And we would be in our sins still. But He is who He said He is. And we praise God for that. I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians 16, 22. And uh, I know that we have, some of you haven't been with us the uh, past couple of times. We've been going through the, fir- the, the, the epistle of 1 Corinthians and we've arrived at the last section of the letter. We've come to that section that includes just the greetings. So there's, there's lots of greetings and, uh, and kisses and love and grace being, being stated as Paul closes out his letter, but in the middle we have, in the middle of this little section, we have the the, the essence of the human condition and, and the need and the necessity and God's provision is right here in this short little verse, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, and it stands out, it jumps out as you read the, as you read it, that last section, 19 to 24, but we'll just focus on 22 today. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. Some of your translations probably have Maranatha, the Aramaic transliteration of those words, but most likely mean uh, come Lord or our Lord, come. Listen, this is this statement is the reason why the world hates biblical Christianity. The world would say, what right does is there for this claim, this statement, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed? How dare you? The world would say. The world is full of diversity and diverse religions and thoughts and ideas and cultures. And that's, of course, true. And much of that diversity is is good and pleasing to the Lord and according to His will. In fact, in Revelation we read that every tribe and tongue, as we sang about, will be there and that will be to the glory of God. But there's only one way for all of those people, from all of that cultural and ethnic diversity, there's only one way to bring them together in unity, worshiping, before the throne. And that comes down to a person. And that person is Jesus. And that's who Paul is talking about when he uses the word Lord. Almost always when he uses the word Lord, he's talking about Jesus. And certainly is here. And if there's any doubt, what we've done is we've surveyed Scripture, selected passages from uh, really the law all the way through the book of Revelation to see that Jesus is the only way of salvation exclusively. There is no hope of salvation outside of Jesus uh, because of who He is and what He's done. He is unique in who He is and unique in what He's done. And this is a a marvelous, uh, clear truth to study, but it's the reason that we have anything else to study. There's, there would be no reason in getting the rest of it right if we miss on this. This we must understand. I'm not saying that the rest of it is not important. All of God's truth is important. But this is our salvation, Jesus. So let's look. Um, what, what I did when I was studying is I began uh, working through um, how, uh, for example, Psalm 2 says, kiss the Son, uh, lest His wrath be quickly kindled against you. That We saw that this figure, this one person, is the ultimate dividing line of all of human history. So we looked in Deuteronomy, we looked in Psalms, and we, we looked through um, much of the New Testament, but what I realized was when it comes to the Gospel of John, virtually the entire book has this purpose, this purpose, to tell us that Jesus is our Savior and He's the only Savior. 
and He's a willing Savior, and he's, he's, he's a loving Savior, and He's a perfect Savior who has accomplished everything that we needed. That's why the Gospel is called Good News. Because it's, it is accomplished in Jesus. So, let's see what the Bible says. Let's keep in mind that uh, skeptics have tried to say that Paul invented Christianity and taught something different than Jesus taught. Uh, and so let's, let's, let's think about that measuring Paul's statement. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Let's compare that to what we find in John's Gospel, what Jesus himself said. Uh, and, and let's see the consistency. There are those who say that, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. There are people who, um, who say all manner of things. But let's, let's just hear the Gospel of John. And I want to start in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, because John simply tells us why he wrote. Why does the Gospel of John exist? Why is there a Bible book called John? It's not because... John was particularly a kind of sentimentally religious kind of person and just kind of felt inspired to write some things down. It's not like other religious writings. It's not his musings. It's not his political agenda. It's, a, it's, it's well, we're told. He tells us. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Which, by the way, why don't we read in, uh, in the passages that, that precede that. I think I had, well, I had planned to come back to that anyway. We'll, we'll just begin in 30 and 31. The Bible says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Now that's the opposite of being accursed. This is how you have life. So, that's why John wrote. So we know right now, why is John writing? John is writing to tell us, to give us information, to give eyewitness testimony to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the prophesied one, uh, the expected one, the anointed one, God's servant of redemption, that that is Jesus and He is the Son of God, and there's no getting around it. That phrase, in His own context in Jewish culture, meant that He made Himself equal with God, which is clear when you read the book of John. And then the result, by believing, you might have life in His name. So let's, let's, this is a selected survey. Look, we could just start in John chapter 1, verse 1, and go all the way through. Uh, and I do want to point out to you that in John... Chapter 1 and verse 1, there is no getting around the fact that John believes that Jesus, he is declaring to us that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. I don't think this one is on the, the, will be on the screen, but let's not skip John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. And we, well, that's, that's amazing. So we're talking about an entity, an individual who was in the beginning. Now look what else we're told about him. He was with God. No question John means us to think of Genesis 1-1 when he starts his book by saying, in the beginning. Genesis 1-1 starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> so, out the gate, he doesn't ease into his testimony about this. He says, in the beginning was the Word and then he tells us two things. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now this word, was, that's a verb of being. It has to do with essence. I want you to come down and look in verse 14 now. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, the Bible doesn't describe anyone else being the source of or being the fullness of grace and truth except for God. So this is just more evidence that supports what, what John said. And, and by the way, I want you to note something that John is doing. He is saying, we have seen. That's, that fits with what he's saying. He says, I'm here as a witness to give you testimony. 
You see, all the claims of Jesus, at least in his life, about who he was, his, his genealogy, all of that, that was actually falsifiable information. You could check that. That's why it's important. Um, Dr. Doug Bookman has, has made a big uh, deal of that, that, and that's important. Jesus being, for example, the son of David. That was, that was necessary that it be falsifiable, and they kept records. Those were destroyed in AD 70 and then AD 135. But, but those were records that could be checked. Is this guy related to David? Could have been checked. Did you, have you ever noticed that none of his enemies ever came with, no, you're not. We don't have a record of that. You know why? Because all the records, everything that you could check out about Jesus checked out. That's why they never had an answer when he said, what do you have against me? The only thing they ever come up with, they ever, ever came up with was because you make yourself out to be God. Well, here's the problem. If God makes himself out to be God, what are you going to charge him with? If he said he wasn't God, he'd be lying. And God doesn't lie, so it's impossible. So the issue was not who Jesus is, but it was who they were. Their hearts. That was the issue. So, let's look, let's look at this. We're going to have to move rapidly. This whole day is a celebration of who Jesus is in communion and in our fellowship time. We're so thankful. We sang that song, Give Thanks, uh, because the Father has given us the Son. It's the ultimate reason to be thankful. All the rest of it are all the good things that come along with that. But you could have all the rest of it and not have the Son. And according to the Bible, you don't have the Father either. If you, if you deny the Son, you deny the Father, John says in First John. So we're so grateful to have the Son. That's everything. Okay, in John 1, let's uh, read verses 11 to 13. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. I mean, that's, that's clear with the history of the crucifixion, right? The leaders of Israel rejected him. But... And I'm grateful for that word. That we're not just lumped in with, with all of humanity, really, in rejecting Jesus, but to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Do you see that that's not something we possess in of our, ourselves to exercise? It's not a right we possess to exercise. It is something that He has given to us. To all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, if you, if you go back and look at last week's sermon and also the sermon on October 24th on our YouTube channel, you see that we reviewed... Again, from Genesis 12, 1 to 3, Isaiah 49, 5 and 6, God's plan of redemption for Israel and the nations. What we're seeing here is it's God's plan. It's God's plan. This is God's plan. I've heard people say, well, I, I don't want to worship a God that just gives one way of salvation. Well, in His mercy, He has created a situation in which you're free to hold that opinion. But you see, that's not His opinion. You see, that? that's not God's opinion. God has a way of salvation, a way of salvation open to sinners, and it's only His way of salvation that counts since He's the God. Well, He's God. So this is of the will of God. So this person who received Him, uh, this, this person who was received, those who received Him, those who believed in His name, those are the ones who are born of God. It's a package deal. There's no such thing as one without the other. Born of God, but not following Jesus. That doesn't exist. Those born of God follow Jesus. Period. And it's Jesus and Jesus alone. It's not some other figure. It's only Jesus. Look at John 3. John chapter 3. And again, this is a survey. I recommend if you really want to hear John's argument, read every verse. Read every verse. 
John 3, uh, starting in verse 16, the famous one, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. The word only is there. God gave His only Son. There's not another way of salvation. We've already read enough to close that possibility off. God so loved the world, so meaning He loved the world in this way, that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. In God. So this is an exclusivity about the only Son of God. And this passage, look, there's lots of things we could look at to see how the Bible lines up with reality. And in apologetics, we could point these things out. But here's a passage that tells us about us. It tells us about humanity after the fall of Adam and Eve and outside of Christ. And here's, here's what we are. We don't want anybody evaluating what we're doing. We don't want any light exposed on what we're doing. We retain that for ourselves. We don't want it exposed and called out and judged we just want to do what we want to do. And that's what every human is doing in the world. But praise God, the light not only exposes our need, uh, but Jesus says the light is, is the light that shines and leads the way out of darkness because of His death, burial, and resurrection. But He's the only one that's doing that. He's the only one that has done that. He's the only one available. Look, uh, you, I think you noticed probably whoever does not believe is condemned already. This helps us to understand that what we're doing right now is living a life, piling up either good or bad works, and then we'll get to the end and be judged, and whatever is, you know, if we have more good, then maybe we make it in. If we have more bad, maybe we don't. That's, you can just give up that thinking. If you're not in Christ right now, you are, per, you are presently in a state of condemnation from God. Uh, you are condemned already. We start condemned just like God said would happen when He was talking with Adam and Eve in the garden. So, little babies are born and they are relatively innocent. That's true, relatively, on human, humanly speaking. But by God's standard, they are not. They are condemned already. And the only escape is the provision that God has given. His Son, uh, who took the penalty in the place of His people and who rose from the grave. Look at verses 35 and 36 to see this truth as well. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Now that verse is enough right there. Remember Paul said, the one who has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. How does the Father feel about the Son? The Father loves the Son, not only that, but has given all things into His hand. He utterly trusts the Son because He knows who the Son is. He's of the same substance that He is. He is God the Son in perfect harmony. And so He has given all things into His hand. And, and remember, the Father is perfect in justice and righteousness and has given all things into the hand of the Son. So those who believe that Jesus is high, but He's not that high. He's not God. Find yourselves opposing the Father who loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Jesus is one of us, but He's also God. He's truly God and truly man. Look at verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You see the word remains? That fits with what John had already said about being condemned already, doesn't it? We're in a state of condemnation. We need to, that's why the word that we use to describe our condition is saved. And so few people uh, ask themselves, saved from what? 
saved from God, saved from the wrath of a, an offended holy God. And by the way, his wrath is pristine in its righteousness. It is perfect in its justice. He's not even capable of an act of injustice because he's the standard of justice. We measure right and wrong by him. You don't even have a sense of right and wrong outside of who God is. So there's no appeal for the rulings of this judge. He's perfect. And has provided the perfect and just salvation in Jesus. John 5. We read from this before uh, in the other sermons. But this is just so clear. Uh, we want to read verse 22 and 23. John 5, 22 and 23. Uh, the passage that we read was 19 to 29. But let's just focus on 22 and 23. The Father judges no one but has given all judgment to the Son. Verse 23 tells us why he did that. Why is he doing that? Why does the Father give all things to the Son and trust all judgment to the Son? Here's the answer in verse 23. That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son, the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And by the way, that's not that, that's Jesus' own self testimony there. That's what Jesus is telling us. So the people who say, well, Paul invented all this about Christianity, that's laughable. It's not even worthy of consideration. And it's supposed to be academic. It's, it's laughable. Please don't miss this. Why do we make such a big deal? Why do we say, in Jesus alone, Jesus alone is salvation and that Jesus is God why is this more than just a point of discussion or a curiosity? It's because whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. And you know what? You don't get to say, well, I honor the Son and then, on, and then do whatever you want to. To honor the Son means to know that He is God, the Son, and that He is the Messiah, and that He is the only way of salvation and that His death, burial, and resurrection is the plan of God for salvation and there is no other. Anything short of that means you are, if, even if you're honoring what you're calling the Son, you're making up a Son and not honoring the biblical one. If you try to replace the true one with a different one, that's not honoring Him. It's not honoring Him. Moving on to John 7. John 7. 37 to 44. This is at the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 37, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. I do want you to note that the qualifier for those who have the benefit of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit are named here as those who believed in Him. Believed in Him. Not just religious people or people who sincerely believe something, but who believed in Him. Those are the exclusive recipients of this life-giving ministry of the Holy Spirit in which He indwells, in which He applies the work of the Son. Those receive the Spirit. Look in verse 40. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. And that's a reference most likely to Deuteronomy 18. Others said, this is the Christ. In other words, this is the Messiah. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Is not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So you can see their ignorance. The whole testimony of the Bible is that where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. By the way, Alma 7.10 says that Jesus was born in Jerusalem, which would be a problem uh, 
for the people understood the son of David should come from that village. Micah 5 2 even says it. So this is an issue. The people brought it up. Isn't he supposed to have, isn't Bethlehem the place? And the answer to that is yes. And that's where Jesus was born. So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. What an understatement. The division continues to this very moment and will continue until all things are put in subjection under his feet. When his enemies are made a footstool, then there will be a unanimity about who is Lord. Because every tongue will say, Jesus is Lord. And every tongue, every, every tongue will confess that, every knee will bow. But until then, there's a division. It started in his own life. In fact, you could say, in a way, it started in the whole history of humanity. Those who belong to God and those who don't. John 8, verse 12 Jesus said, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, in our everyday lives, our lives are so uh, tedious sometimes that we we just think, you know, everything's just kind of happening. What is today's schedule? What's the next thing? What's the next bill to pay? And then sometimes we get into seasons of life where we are distraught and in despair and in need and and we don't know what we're going to do. And it's in those times that we might have a better perspective on appreciating this promise that when we follow Jesus, we have the light of life. And it's now into eternity. But it's those who follow Jesus, not some other figure. Chapter 8, still, but turn over to 43 to 47. 43 to 47. This is Jesus talking with Jewish people and uh, and Jewish religious leaders. And uh, he says that they're of their father, the devil. Let's start reading verse 43 because they don't believe this is a these these verses forty three to forty seven expose sadly that the history of American Christianity and maybe in other parts of the world I don't know I know American Christianity better has allowed the flesh to turn this passage upside down and the the upside down misunderstanding reversal of what's said here has become. The standard. So let's read these verses. Why do you not understand what I say? This is Jesus speaking. He just asked that question. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Now here's the standard evangelical approach to evangelism. They say that the problem is that the person is not of God. What is the solution? Well, they must hear Jesus' words and believe. Do you see that that is the opposite cause and effect that Jesus just explained? He said, you don't believe me because I'm telling you the truth. And you are not of God. What does that do to our evangelistic efforts? Does it not make us go stand back and say, hmm. Well, then, we're not going to be able to get this done. Exactly. Exactly. That is the message of the Bible from creation until now. 
You have no hope in and of yourselves. Coming to a conclusion that is perfect and right and good that brings about a change of heart, that's only a work that God can do. It's, Jesus is saying to them, the problem is not lack of information. It's spiritual. Your heart must be changed. Your heart must be changed. And so that's why in our evangelism, what we need to do is seek to be clear. It's good to be winsome. It's good to be personable and polite and to show that we are loving and that we are concerned and we care. But the Lord Jesus himself told these unbelievers, the reason you do not believe is that is because I tell you the truth. Your heart is not a truth heart. It's a lie heart. And you reject the truth. So, this is the reason for division. People don't like that at all. No, no descendant of Adam and Eve likes that. Uh, in fact, that is a declaration of war for the sovereignty of that person's life. And God says, I made you, you're mine. And humanity says, you know, the devil said, the serpent said, has God really said, let's just think about this thing. And onto the scene has come Jesus, our only hope of salvation. And so if you reject him, you have no hope. And it will be shown that the wrath of God abides on you as a, as a, a child of the devil. That is hard truth from the Word of God. And the reason that people flock away from it, <laughs> uh, they rejoice to go any direction but toward this reality. But this is who Jesus is. And it's the reason that Paul is accurate when he says, whoever has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. That's not Paul's decree. That's Paul's acknowledgement of reality. Because that's the reality. Look at verses 57 and 59. Let's remind ourselves, who is the one who's saying this? This is hard. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe? That's hard. Because in my flesh, I want the solution to be, well, okay, they don't, they don't believe because they need the truth. But Jesus said, you don't believe because you hate the truth. The truth is not the problem. Lack of the truth is not the problem. We had somebody tell us just the other day, well, if I had enough evidence, I would believe. And, of course, the biblical response to that is, no, you wouldn't. You have more evidence already that you could ever, you don't even deserve the evidence. And it's right in front of you in the air you breathe, everywhere you look. That's not the problem. Lack of evidence. Your heart is the evidence. I saw it lived out. What, what I'm reading about here, there it was. And it's, it's all around us. 57 to 59, the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? And that's, let's back up so you know why he said that. 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. Saw and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You're not 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was... Now let me stop right there for a second. Let me tell you something that would have been miraculous, hard to believe, if he had said, Before Abraham was, I was. That would have been amazing, wouldn't it? That's not what he said. In, in the Greek, the words that are written that he said are ego I me. I, I myself am. An emphatic I am. And in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, those are the very words in the Bible, in that Greek translation, when when. God spoke to Moses from the bush, and Moses said, Who am I to tell them has sent me? He said, Tell them that I am has sent you. That's why we know him as the I am. So that the Jews understood. So before Abraham was I am, let's see what their next response is. Did they think, Well, that's an interesting theological point that I'd like to rebut? They skipped that, didn't they? Verse 59, so they picked up stones. <laughs> Apparently, there was no word that followed Jesus' announcement before Abraham was, I am. And it, well, i got to find a rock to bash this guy's head in. I mean, that's, that's what happened. 
Now, you may not be looking for a rock. People may not be looking for a literal rock because Jesus' literal head is not here to try to crush. But the Bible divides humanity into people who love the Lord or in, in this group. That's the only two categories there are. You don't get to say, well, now I don't want to bash his head in, but I, I, I don't believe he is who he said he was. Then the wrath of God abides on you, just like on these people who picked up stones when he told them who he really was. See, that's the thing. He really was in that moment and is, continues to be the I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, this is interesting. He knew what their response would be. And later on, when we find out that they were plotting, you know what their plot was? Hey, let's don't do, do this during Passover. There will be a big crowd. We may risk some problems. But when did it happen? It happened when Jesus looked at Judas and said, what you're doing, go and do it now. How could Jesus be running the plot against himself? It's because he's the I am. That's how. He chose the very moment when that happened. He was no victim. Look at John 10, 22 to 30. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. The Feast of Dedication, by the way, is not one of the feasts commanded to be observed, and yet Jesus participated in it. That's, I think, some that's telling. He lived in that culture. It was not celebrating a bad thing. It was celebrating a good thing uh, during the intertestamental period. Hanukkah. So Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And it goes on in verse 39, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. See, they, they, they just couldn't bear this, what they called blasphemy. John 11, 23-27. This is uh, after Lazarus had died. Jesus delayed while he was sick. He died, and then Jesus showed up in Bethany. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. See, Martha had some good theology. That's, she was right. She knew about the resurrection, but Jesus makes a stunning claim that no human being other than him, the God-man, could make. When she brought up the resurrection, here's his commentary on it. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Here's the question for you. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. That's the only correct answer to that question. John 12, 44 to 50. John 12, 44 to 50. Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I've come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. And by the way, that darkness is what you get when you decide to live by your own moral standard, your own code, your own preferences, your own convictions, instead of your Creator's agenda and His code and His standard. This is just light or darkness. That's the only two possibilities. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, 
I do not judge him, but I, for I did not come into the world to judge, but to save the world. I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Jesus speaks for God the Father. Jesus is the true spokesman, the true prophet for God. John 20, 24 to 29. Remember, listen, again, you need to read the book of John if you want to know the full understanding of this. Here's what led up to what we started with where John said Jesus did many other things, but these are written so that you might know that he's the Son of God and believing in him might have life. Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. This is after the resurrection, by the way. This is in the same situation we ourselves are in. After the resurrection. Thomas is in the situation that we are in. After the resurrection. He has not physically seen Jesus. We have not physically seen Jesus. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the hand in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand to his side... I'll never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. That's us. And then John says, So I'm writing to tell you what I am so that you may believe that he is the Son of God and believe you might have life in his name. Look at 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9 now. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. Peter agrees with John here. And he, he affirms what Jesus was saying to Thomas. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. Remember what we're thinking about, 1 Corinthians 16, 22. The one, if, someone, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Why are we obtaining the outcome of our faith? It's not because of the quality of our faith. It's not because who we are that have faith. It's because of the object of our faith. The Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus knew that He was not going to physically present Himself to all those that would become part of His body. But His plan was to to commission the apostles and for the apostles to go out. And then in John 17, He actually prayed for all of those who would believe because of the apostles' words. If you're a Christian here today, that's the category you're in. Through the preaching of what the apostles preached the gospel, you believe. You believe Jesus paid for your sins in taking the penalty of God's justice on Himself. You believe that He rose again. You believe the witness, the testimony, and you believe because God has worked and poured out grace and faith given as a gift has come so that we obtain the outcome of our faith, salvation of our souls. So, 1 Corinthians 16.22 doesn't seem so absurd or far related from what we kind of think of Christianity. The world thinks of Christianity. Maybe the best things about Christianity is how nice it is. Nice and polite and soft. And it's the reason for people panicking when they read, if anyone has no love for the Lord, may be a curse. Wait a minute, we're going to have to theologize ourselves out of this one. 
instead of just understanding this is Christianity. You either love the Lord or you don't. You either love the Lord or you don't. And this is not some new condition that we get into when we consider Jesus. This is the state of sinful humanity. Galatians 3.10 Galatians 3.10 says, and it's quoting Deuteronomy 27.26 Look, this is, this is the state of humanity in our sin. This is our relationship to the law of God. Okay? This is how the law, or living a good life, or being a good person, this is how, this is what it is. Galatians 3.10 For all who rely on works of the law are doing their best to make it to heaven and we'll see what happens. Is that what it says? That's not what it says, is it? Do you know that there are a whole lot of religious people relying on the works of the law? Did you know that in St. George, Utah, the vast majority of the people here are relying on works of the law? And it would be helpful for them if it said, are doing their best and we'll see how it turns out. I mean, that's not all that hopeful, right? But that at least has some hope. Let's see what God says about it. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Under a curse. What curse is that? Is it some made up curse of the church? No. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. You either have perfectly kept the law of God or you are susceptible to His wrath and justice. All of it. And remember what James said. He said, first of all, in, uh, in James 1, if you are 2.10... If you don't keep all of it, you're guilty of all of it. I mean, basically. You can keep all of it and fail in one point. Well, now you're, there's only law keepers and law breakers. You kept 99% of it. Well, you're a law breaker. And then he said, the one who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him that's a sin. You're either sinless or sinful. You fail to do what you should have done once. You are sinful. That's why Paul just says, look, you relying on the works of the law? Well, then you're under a curse unless you keep all of it perfectly always. And that's nobody. So, his statement stands. All who rely on works of the law are under a curse. So here's what I'm telling you today. Don't rely on works of the law. Avoid that, just forget that track. That will lead to, we have an outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. The outcome of our effort to please God will lead to the lake of fire. It is an insult to God's plan of salvation when we substitute our own. And so, this is our only hope. So if you have no love for the Lord Jesus, you remain in the position of any person in the world ever who fails to obey every point of God's law perfectly, both uh, uh, passive and active. You're cursed. But today I hold up to you Christ, the Messiah. He's your only hope. Run to Him in repentance and faith. Trust Him. Love Him. And believers... Do not allow your circumstances to distract you from the love, from love for the Lord Jesus. In the book Gentle and Lowly, which I believe is very good, there's some parts that I think you got to consider. But Dane Ortland wrote, If my life is any evidence of the mercy of God in Christ, you might think, I'm not impressed. To you, I say, the evidence of Christ's mercy towards you is not your life. The evidence of His mercy toward you is His Mistreated, misunderstood, betrayed, abandoned. John began his description of the last week of Jesus' public ministry, beginning in chapter 13 in this way. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's who Jesus is. Love Him. Trust Him. Come to Him. It's our only hope. And for those who love Him, it is a certain hope. Our only hope, but a certain hope. 
love the Lord Jesus. Now, uh, we're about to, to sing a song before we have the supper together, so music team, if you all will come up.